live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's The Q at the HP Vertica Big Data Conference 2014. Brought to you by HP. With your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Welcome back to Boston, everybody. This is Dave Vellante, and this is The Cube. We're here, chowder, lobster, and big data. Uh, the Cube is SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. We've been doing wall to wall coverage here at HP's big data conference, Vertica's big data conference. It's our second year here. A uh, lot of customers that we've been interviewing, uh, particularly over the last two years. Uh, Conservation International is here. Jorge Ahumada, Ayumada, and Eric Figris are here. And uh, we're going to talk about what Conservation International does, what they're doing with data. We had a question uh, this morning in the audience when we were up on stage, and somebody asked, well, you know, everybody talks about big data driving revenue and you know, getting people to click on ads. What are people doing with big data to affect the world, you know, change the human condition? So, Jorge, thanks very much, and Eric, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate you guys thanks, Dave. coming on. So, thanks, Dave. tell us first about Conservation International. You know, that question this morning kind of hit on, we used you guys as an example of yeah. how the, you know, you're helping to change the world. So, set it up. Tell us about Conservation International and what you do there. Yeah, Conservation International is a nonprofit organization. We're 25 years old. And we work in trying to uh, marry human well-being with nature. So rather than you know, live at the expense of nature, we want to live you know, with nature and demonstrate how nature is important for people. Um, so basically we work with governments and partners all over the world to try to achieve this mission and, and make the world more livable. Right? And how are you funded? <laughs> we, we're funded through a variety of, of private donations and, 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 and you know, government grants and things like that. And, and talk a little bit about the history of the organization. You know, when, when did you start and uh, what's your journey been like? Uh, Conservation International started about 25 years ago. Uh, it, it was a kind of a, it, it came out of, of another large organization, the Nature Conservancy, as a, as a kind of an international program for that organization. And then it grew up and uh, now you know, we're, we're working over 25 countries all over the world. And Eric, you're, you're, you're the IT guy, right? You're not, you know, it's just, driving all this data, and so how, now how long have you been with the firm? So let's see, I've been with Conservation International, it's coming up on uh, eight years now. Yeah. I call it the firm, it's really an organization. Yeah. Eight years, okay, yep. so you've seen, you, you predated the big data meme, although according to Tom Davenport, it started in 2005. So. Right. <laughs> but, uh, I wasn't talking big data in 2005, but nonetheless, <laughs> you predated the, what the, the general consensus yeah. around big data, so you've seen quite a few changes. Yeah, yeah, I think one of the key things that's really, that's really exciting about um, our partnership with HP and, and the HP Earth Insights is that we've, we've taken technology out of the traditional IT role of supporting you know, laptops, hardware, telecommunications, and, and put technology in the forefront of um, programs um, within the organization that are trying to carry out mission, mission level type work, right? Um, so in our case, we work on a long-term biodiversity monitoring network, and so we're able to take um, a lot of the cutting-edge technologies in terms of sensors and different different types of devices, collect information, develop the IT, IT systems that go from the field, you know, all over the world, bring them into servers and databases, and then get that information out into the public, and then as well as have some analytics on top of that. So Hori, you <coughs> talked in your keynote yesterday about you know, the importance, the relationship between nature and, and you know, the human condition. I wonder if you could ad address that a little bit. What is that relationship? Well, you know, the, a lot, we take a lot of things for granted. You know, we breathe air, we, we, we consume food, you know, we have all these things, and, and we rarely think about where they come from. And a lot of these things come from nature. I mean, the food you eat comes from soils that uh, you know, are built upon from thousands and thousands of years of, of plants decomposing. And the air you breathe comes from forests and plants producing oxygen. So, and the water is also, you know, regulated via forests and natural <coughs> lands. So all these things uh, we kind of take for granted, but they all come from nature. And we just kind of disconnected in an era of, dis you know, we're disconnected a little bit from, from all those sources. So, you know, we're trying, trying to, to, to build an, a new model of sustainable development where you know, rather than 
develop at the expense of nature, we developed in conjunction with nature. And then we have a kind of sustainable solutions that, that favor both nature, which we need, and, and us as societies. I was struck by your keynote yesterday. You kind of, I would say, I don't want to say soft peddled the message, but you weren't in our face about the message, uh, which you could be. Because you know, when you look at spikes in consumption, uh, in, in CO2, uh, levels in population. I mean, they're quite alarming since the you know the the dawn of the industrial revolution. Um, but you didn't you didn't, as I say, jam that down our throat. Rather, you focused on the things that your organization is doing to imp to improve that. So my question is, so why the uh, the soft-handed approach? You weren't heavy-handed with that. Have you found that that's more effective? Because it seems like many people, particularly in this country, don't care or don't want to listen. Maybe they care but maybe there's a minority who care. The average you know, individual does take it for granted. So have you found that when you're presenting to audiences and talking to people that it's just, is there no point in trying to beat them over the head with, with this data? You know, God, if, they, if they read God's last offer and they didn't believe it, then you know, who are you to change their minds? I was struck by that. Talk about that a little bit. Well, no, that's very interesting. I mean, I, th I think that, you know, that there's, there's several approaches you could take on this, and one of this is scaring people, of course. But I think we should rather focus on the solutions rather than trying to scare people. And we. You know, I think data-driven solutions are a way to go because you're, it's, data is telling you things and it's not really taking you know, a view of, of anything. It's just looking at the world in that way and trying to understand why it's happening and how can we solve it. And so you know, I think we should just focus on that and, 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 and focus on the positive and focus on what can we do moving forward rather than trying to, you know, um, focus on the on the problems and, and 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 how to change people's minds i mean ultimately it's about bringing people into conservation and 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 making people understand that it's 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 actually a matter of survival you know it's important for our species to be aware of this because otherwise we're going to be gone and and we're going to be gone at the expense of nature right so when you think about um your organization and the, and the data um and interpreting the data what's the data telling you uh, in, in our particular program, uh, in team, what we're finding is that a, a lot of these species that are uh, living in tropical forests are actually doing pretty well. And that's something that, you know, it's, it's good to know. I mean, we, we don't want to be, you know, beating down the message of everything is going down to hell. No, we're, we're happy to, to see that. There are some problems, of course, there are some species that are declining and, and, and most of those species are not species that, that we should, we're, paying attention to, you know, from the traditional conservation point of view. But that's the whole idea for, for a, you know, an early warning system that we have, a data-driven early warning system. Now we, can, we have the data, we can show what's happening, and people can make informed decisions that way. And, and what are the data sources? The data sources are camera traps. We put camera traps uh, all throughout our 17 sites in, the, in tropical forests. And these camera traps just, you know, they, they don't have an agenda. They sit there, an animal passes by, you know, it takes a picture, and we use that information as a way to assess abundance of these species and, and, and then fit trends to this data so we can know whether the species is increasing, decreasing, et cetera. So Eric, so uh, we do a lot of video on the cube, obviously, and, and uh, sometimes it's hard to interpret that data. So you have a, a challenge. So how do you do that? Do you have a, a metadata taxonomy? Uh, is it just you know people watching videos until their eyes bleed? So talk about that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> yes and yes. It's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. So right now we're still mostly dealing with stills, so single, um, you know, uh, digital photography, digital images. Uh, camera traps are moving towards video, so that's something we're going to have to really dig into. Um, we've developed tools. We had to, when we started this project, there was no way we could have actually collected the data that we wanted given the current t suite of tools that was available for our community. So we developed our, our own um, software solution to be able to manage and and basically tag and, and make all that metadata that we need for each image. Um, but we, yeah, we, I mean, we, we uh, create a whole suite of metadata around the image. We examine all the EXIF data within the, within the image itself. And we, we store it in the database and then it turns into, um, it turns into the data that we use in the analytics. <clears throat> you make it sound so simple. <laughs> so uh, I'm interested in uh, this, 
innovation you had to develop, because you couldn't buy anything off the shelf is what I'm hearing. And video, uh, I obviously got that wrong. Video would be just too much data and not really worth it at this point in time, at this right? Point. Uh, Soon. And, and probably too expensive to store still, mm -hmm. uh, and probably too hard to find what you're looking for. So how's it work? So the cameras are triggered? by motion? Yes, yeah, Jorge was saying the animals walk by the sensors, there's heat motion sensors on these, a series of images are taken, the, am the animal's captured, hopefully it's not running too fast and we don't miss it. Um, then what happens is the site managers and the technicians uh, collect the, the uh, SD cards out of the cameras, um, they go back to the lab, they use our software to process these, these data and all the, all the images, excuse me, and then um, all the data and images get sent to our servers and then it goes into the pipeline and the analytics process that we've developed. So the software that you develop, it, it auto <laughs> classifies, auto tags? The um, it, it's, it's not fully automated. What it does is it, it facilitates the, the image annotation. So it groups images based on uh, time and where it was collected. And so it really, you know, they can go, th go through it pretty quickly. And then uh, presumably you want some information in there about the species, is absolutely. that right? So, that's, so a, that's a human task? Absolutely, we look at that, we look at the image, we want to identify the species and how many individuals are in that, in that species, or in that image. And that data gets in there, just to clarify, by, by you know, human. human, so that's it's site-based, and you guys are yep. such a mechanical Turk. Yep, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what kind of volume are we talking about here? I mean, how uh, many we, cameras, we how have much a, data? We, right now we have a couple million images, so it's, you know, it's, not, it's not huge in terms of like what something like Facebook is going to deal with, but you know when we where we where we work, I mean if, if a site manager has to go through fifteen thousand or thirty thousand images, that's a lot of work. You know you can imagine sc scrolling through these even in, in groups. So, and then that gets in goes into your database, and and so then what happens? I mean who has access to it? How do you use it? How is it organized? And you know do you ever delete data? You probably we, ne not, we never right? delete data. It's curated. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, get, it gets turned into the wildlife picture index. Uh, analytics, it goes into our analytics system. Um, and yeah, we have various users that can come in and curate the, curate the data. Okay, so, so there's a curation there, and so that's what the primary use is the curation and then the, the, the rendering, right? So that. Correct, yeah. So yeah. that anybody can come to your website, see the pictures, but you're also analyzing the data. Yeah. Right. So, mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit. So, so yeah. So, we developed this wildlife picture index and analytics system, and this is what we did with HP. That really shows the trends of the species in the tropical forest over time. Um, and the other, the other key point is that all the data we produce, whether it's primary data or synthetic data, is all publicly available. So, we look at ourselves as a global public um, resource. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right. So, talk about Hori. Talk a little bit about how the data kind of turns into both insights and, and action. So you have all this data, so you see some species are doing well, some species not so well. So what, what do I do with that information? Yeah, so uh, this, is, this is kind of the key, the key question and uh, um, a, lot of people, a lot of people that work in protected areas in, throughout the world and especially in the tropical areas, they don't have access to any information or very little access to information about what's happening at their park, right? They might collect data, might be a little bit of data here and there, but not enough to tell them the big picture. And so this, this, this um, uh, work that we do really goes back to them. And, and through this uh, uh, wildlife picture index system that we developed with HP using Vertica technology, <laughs> we can now go down and, and tell them, these are the species that you, that you know, your park that you should be concerned about. And so they can then use that information to talk to their bosses or their managers and implement ways to find out, okay, what maybe we need to patrol more here because this species seems to be declining and maybe this is to do with poaching or maybe the species is moving up the, the mountain because of climate changes. So maybe we need to start thinking about what are we gonna, how we're gonna protect that area up there. So it, it really starts a conversation about how to effectively manage wildlife, which is a big problem because people don't have data on this. Well, and I would imagine too, uh, there's concerns about, okay, if we solve one problem, we may be creating another problem. H how do you sort of de-risk that? Is that just a matter of you working with ex experts, your job is to provide the data and it's their job to sort of sort out the domino effects? Or I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, th there's, there, there, could, there could be some trade-offs that you have to take when you protect one species, you might not be able to protect all the species. But, um, but we, you know, we are kind of at the beginning stages of this network where just having some data, at mm -hmm. least three or four years of data, is, 
is gold because right. it's really the, before the, the other option is zero. It's like the Hubble telescope. Wow! Right, exactly. You know, yeah. We never so, knew that existed. So I don't right. think they're too worried about trade-offs at this point. I think they're just a lot of these of our site managers and people that work in these areas are really happy to have data that they can be they can show whether you know protecting this park is really working or not, and that's that's good enough. And and the data source is primarily or exclusively the the, the camera. Snaps or so. So we use camera trap data as well as climate data, and um, we also use a handful of other covariate data to try and look at what could be impacting the trends that we're seeing. So it could be like human presence, deforestation, um, or potentially climate. Um, I was just going to echo on what Jorge was saying. Yeah, please. Uh, you know, one of the really exciting things is what we're doing is we're we're kind of shining the light in areas of the world and part of our natural resources that we don't know what's happening. So that's really you know we're letting. We're, we're finding out new things, and it's data-driven, and it's unbiased, and that's that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So so, but but the primary source of <coughs> the species data are the camera traps. Absolutely. Is that, is that's that right. right? Yes. Absolutely. How do you baseline it? Like, where, how do you, where do you start from? Is it are you doing your own baselining based on frequency of of snaps? Um, and how do you you know uh, uh, ensure? You know, statistical validity and all that other good stuff. How do you baseline it? So, the, so the base. I mean, the, the first year we start, that's our baseline, yep. right? That's our year of reference. And actually, the wildlife picture index is anchored at that year, and we're measuring changes relative to that first year. Uh, how do we ensure statistical validity? Well, we we've consulted with over 200 scientists before we developed this protocol. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you know we we made it up. We actually talked to people that know about this, and we designed. A protocol that actually has enough power to detect change, you know, at the 5% level, for example, annual changes in 5% trends. So we're pretty sure that our protocol and our data are sensitive enough to, to if we want to detect change. And what were, the, what were the skill sets that you had to bring on board to accomplish this? Uh, I presume they didn't just fall out of the sky and into your lap. So. You had to think about this problem, starting with a blank piece of paper, essentially, and obviously got history, you know, 25 year history, uh, but now you're attacking the problem differently. Did you have to bring in statisticians, new types of experts? Uh, I wonder if you could talk about this, the skilling. Yeah, I mean, as I was saying, you know, when we designed this, we designed it with, with experts, and you know, we had to talk to statisticians, we had to talk to people doing camera trapping in the, in the ground that knew about how to do it. We had to consult with many, many people that work in the field to you know, verify whether we could do this in, a, in the scale that we were proposing to do. Nobody had done it at that scale. You know, people had gone out. We put 60 camera traps, one camera trap every two square kilometers. Initially, when we said, let's do it that way, everybody said, no, that's impossible. We'll ne never be able to do that. And then we found out that some people were doing it in Asia and other places. So you know, it's something that we had to actually say, no, that's the way we're going to go. And, you so know, they said you couldn't do it. No. People said, oh, yeah, you can do it, and yep. you did it. And we did it, yeah. And, okay. and so, <laughs> so, you know, there was, it, was some, it was a scale. People, when putting camera traps, they used to put like a couple of camera traps, you know, in, within a couple of miles, and that's it, right? But if we were talking about, you know, 150 square miles covered by camera traps. It's, a, it's an entirely new scale that we're looking at. So, so it, it just kind of changed the conversation, and, and then we had that produced a big data set which we were not prepared to deal with, right? So we were saying, okay, let's do this. And then we started getting all these images, right? Thousands and thousands of images. And it's like, wow, what are we going to do with all this? <laughs> yeah, this is really cool. How are we going to cool. process this but, information? Yeah. And that's how, you know, we came, we fortunately, you know, kind of came into, into our partnership with HP. And that's how, so we, you know, now we bring this, all this whole other kind of data science and, and you know, business and engineering and software developers into the, into the mix to really help us accomplish, you know, kind of what looked like a simple kind of data product in the beginning. Right, so you had to engineer this system, this sort of ingest and metadata management mm -hmm. and, yeah. and storage system right. that yep. didn't exist. Um, you mentioned climate data, so you're connecting to public climate data, and you got some APIs that you can tunnel it, into? It's, it, we actually have, we, we have uh, meteorological stations that we set up, so it's kind of your traditional traditional meteorological stations with data logger, temperature, relative humidity, solar radiation. So they're your, that's your infrastructure? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, because guess what? There's, there's <laughs> no exist. climate data yeah, right. in tropical forests. Right. I mean, so we had to put our own climate stations with our own, you know, with a world accepted standards. 
And we also kind of fetch some data from satellites and other public available sources, but you really need that ground data to be able to ground it to the truth because you know the other data is usually remote data. Remote what are data. the politics of doing this? Do you have to cajole local governments or are they receptive to this? Or? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we had to work individually with each government, within each government where, you know, where we have the site. And, and negotiate with them you know, what, are, what are the terms of, of our involvement. And especially in the beginning, it was fairly difficult to convince people to, to release the data. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about you know, 2001, 2002, nobody was talking about publicly available data or very little publicly available data then. So, so that was a big challenge, but people are now starting to see the benefits because it's creating a whole new way of doing conservation. And I apologize if I missed this, but can you again <coughs> quantify the scale for us, I mean, in terms of however you look at it, number of cameras, um, amount of data. Yeah, so you know we're we're probably receiving between you know 400,000 and 450,000 images per year. We're working in 16 countries and 17 sites throughout the tropics. We have over a thousand camera traps, that are out there. and you know we're probably monitoring, I don't know, millions of football fields yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, forest, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, every year. And uh, do you know how much data, I mean offhand, Eric? Uh, so right, total data, I mean, when we're doing backups, we have probably have about nine, nine terabytes or so. Ten nine terabytes. terabytes? Ten terabytes, yeah. So, yeah. It's, and it's decent. Yeah, it's decent size. It's it, a lot for um, us. Yeah, but it's not, it, it's not a it's, ridiculous amount no, of information. No, it's not, right? no. Um, but, it, you know, for, for everything's relative, right? And so for us, it, it, it was challenging. And in particular, some of the, the modeling that we do um, produces a lot of simulations and outputs. So right. we have to be able to capture and store that. Right. Excellent. All right, we'll get in the hook here. Uh, appreciate you guys coming on and sharing your story. Okay. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE. We're live from Boston. We'll be right back. <laughs>